Hello and welcome to this latest edition of the Virtual Bridge Sessions and today I'm joined by Walter Patterson um, who will be talking about all things digital. Well, not all things perhaps, but where one should start on their digital journey. <laughs> and we're talking about digital baselines. So Walter, tell us more. Okay, thanks Kenji. Um, I'm going to move to share a screen with you. We're all about the sharing here. All about the bit sharing, okay. Well, good morning and thanks to Kenji for the introduction and I'd also like to thank another CDN researcher, Dr. Nula Broderick, who carried out a fair portion of the work for this particular study with some support from myself. From myself. And I get the privilege this morning of uh, talking to you about the work that was undertaken in that study and some of the outcomes, outputs from it. So the, the first thing to remember is that the CDN has already published a digital capability report, a Scottish landscape review, which had four recommendations at the end of it. <clears throat> uh, the first of those recommendations was that we needed a set of key terms to be defined. And that arose because when we were talking to colleges and, and looking at their digital strategies, we did note that there were quite a number of terms that were in use, such as hybrid delivery or flipped classroom or blended learning. Being used, they were being used in a, an inconsistent manner, even within the same document. So the first output from the research was a set of key terms, 13 key terms, which are now available from CDN in the form of posters. So you can get A3 or A4 size posters downloaded from the CDN website. CDN also took the nice step of engaging the visual thinkery to produce these images that are representative of the, of the terms. And they also did the same for the lecturer digital skills. So these eight skills were defined as outputs from the landscape review. And these icons, I suppose you could call them, were developed to illustrate those particular competencies. <clears throat> now, the third output from the study was the baseline support staff digital capabilities. And I'm not going to pause on this because I'm going to come back to these at the, the end of the talk. But what I want to do is outline where those terms have come from. So you might ask the question, why, why did we decide to produce this all staff or support staff digital baseline? It wasn't in the original plan the original thought was that we would look only at lecturer digital capabilities. But in the interviews, we found a lot of people saying, why are you only looking at lecturer skills? Shouldn't we be looking at all staff skills? When we took the results from the landscape review to focus group sessions at the end, they were saying the same thing. Where is the set of skills for support staff? And alongside that, we've got a national focus now on producing a digitally skilled workforce and citizens who have got some level of digital literacy. And of course, we've got the whole business about business itself being transformed through digital. I noticed an interesting comment on the Future Scott newsletter yesterday about Mercat Tours, which is the company that runs the ghost tours in Edinburgh. 
And it was saying that their whole business model has changed through COVID to becoming much more about giving people digital access to some of the experiences. So that was, that was a, another indication of how much of a transformation there has been in work practices. Then the digital ambition statement for colleges that was published last year, there is a section in there that deals with capability. And it suggested that there would be a common minimum standard of digital skills for key groups of staff. So we felt that producing a support staff baseline was in line with that ambition. So this statement from Accenture in 2020 illustrates the whole point that it's no longer just about becoming um, digital for the sake of it, but it's now an imperative for businesses to survive in the modern world. So you're probably all aware that Scotland's government has published um, a, a blueprint for a digital Scotland. It's called A Changing Nation, How Scotland Will Thrive in the Digital World. And one of the principles that they've, they've, they've set out six principles, and one of them is to sustain a digital future for Scotland by ensuring that young people are equipped with the skills to thrive in a digital world. So the idea of a workforce that is, has got digital skills is very much in the Scottish government mind at the moment. And if we look beyond Scotland, for example, if we look to Australia, we find that the Australian government has published um, a, a, a program it's called Foundation Skills for Your Future. It is about young people, and they have produced a digital skills framework. If we look at Canada, we find the same thing, that the Canadian government has published. Uh, it's got a scheme, actually, which is called Decent Jobs for Youth. I like that, Decent Jobs for Youth. And as part of that, they've published this Digital Skills Toolkit. They've also got uh, another initiative in Canada called Tech Nation, uh, which also has uh, references to this toolkit. And if we turn to Europe now, we find that France has a national digital plan, a national plan for digital inclusion, which includes both citizenship and the reskilling of, of its uh, workforce. If we look at the, the Italian national plan, we find that uh, it looks quite exciting, actually, doesn't it? So, so we take um, education and training, we take a, an active workforce, um, specialists in ICT and citizens, and we take them down the hill, then we go up on the chairlift, down the ski slope, up the chairlift again, down the ski slope again. And wow, well, look what happens at the end. These bland blue people have turned into multicolored specialists in ICT. Why can't we do that in Scotland? The Spanish National Framework for Digital Capability is set out in that form of a table with five areas of competence. And some of you might recognize this. Yes, indeed, it is none other than the output from the European project, Building Digital Skills, which led to the Digital Competence Framework which is now in version 2.1, Digcom 2.1. And I should just say at this point that all of the previous frameworks, including the Australian and the Canadian one, all make reference to this, this framework. And indeed, some recent research was published which asked digital experts to look over frameworks 
uh, given the whole raft of frameworks that there are out there. And Pitchcock 2.1 was um, deemed to be the most useful of frameworks that were available. So it, it's got, you'll see it says eight levels of competence, but also five areas of competence, information and data literacy, communication and collaboration, digital content creation, safety, and problem solving. So no real surprises there for anyone that has been looking at digital competence frameworks. But it's interesting the way in which this is set out within that framework document. So for each competence area, there is a descriptor of the competence. And then what they've done is they've taken a particular task. So they've said, what would happen if, for example, we wanted to, to um, organize an event? What digital skills might we need to do that? And so if I just go forward a bit, we can see that we've got levels three and four in their scale. And if you're going to organize an event, here is the skill that you might have at level three. And here are skills that you might demonstrate at level four. So it's a fairly explicit framework that sets out for, for several exemplar work examples what each level might represent in terms of a, an, a particular action or behavior. Now, I should say that there is also a set of skills for a set of examples for citizenship. And I'll, I'll come back to that thought in a moment. Now, coming closer to home, back to the UK, the UK government did publish in 2020 its essential digital skills. And it's represented now and not in a table, but in a nice wheel. And the importance of that is that one of the areas of competence is now represented as an overarching one. So be safe, le legal and confident online is now seen as a kind of overarching or encompassing skill that everyone ought to have. So whether they're engaged in communicating or handling information and content, they will always seek to be safe, legal, and confident. Now, the one that's different in here is that one called transacting. And so you can understand that the government is very interested in people applying for services, either through national or local government, but also the whole business about buying and selling and booking your holidays and doing your banking. So they're very keen that people should have those skills. So if you look at that diagram, you'll see that some of the skills are about being related to citizenship, and, and, but some are really more focused on, on the workplace, such as finding solutions to problems and using digital tools and online services. The way in which this is exemplified in the Essential Digital Skills Framework is that they have identified the competencies, skills for life. This example is about handling information. They've then said, and if you're in the workplace, you'll need these other skills along with those. Um, and here's an example of what you can do as a citizen. And here's an example or some examples of what you could do in the workplace. So that, that's quite a helpful setting out. But you'll notice that in, in, in the European and the UK uh, frameworks, there is this emphasis on life skills and citizenship as well as, as the workplace. So Noah and I decided that we really should try and look for something more specific to the workplace. So we looked at this framework from digital workplace research. And uh, so the first interesting thing is that 
they're not into tables or circles. They oh, they like triangles. I like triangles too. But four areas of competence now. And you'll notice the top one there is about reflecting on and adapting one's digital practices. So, so that's interesting because that, that's about, I guess, a, a, a mindset thing. You know, are you prepared to stand back and think about what you're doing in, digi in your digital practice and, and being prepared to, to, to adapt or change? And again, that's something that uh, I'm going to refer to shortly. The digital workspace, workplace skills framework then reverts to tables. And the first thing that was interesting for me is that they're no longer talking about basic, intermediate or advanced. They're, they've invented these other words, establish, safeguard, optimize, innovate. So these represent levels of competence as we go through. I don't know why they've chosen that, but perhaps they felt that those were, were more descriptive of the sub-competence that's required. You know, just as an example, if you look at Think and Adapt, uh, the, the, the highest level in there is reflect, being aware of one's digital practices and reflecting on what works well. And what that tells me is that the view being taken there is that this, this is the, the, the um, highest level that you might reach uh, in, in terms of your competence. So it's what, what we might come back to again. I keep saying I'm going to come back to things, but honestly, <laughs> I am. So it's a higher order skill reflect, reflection and adapting, being aware. Right, now, back to college land. So again, digital ambition statement. We just remind ourselves of what was said there. And so having looked at all of these frameworks and noted that when we come to look at things which are specifically about the workplace, we find that we are immediately looking at higher order skills in general compared to those that are dealing with digital literacy and digital citizenship. Now, colleges also have published strategies for their digital futures. <clears throat> and we looked at the language that's used in there and people talk about upskilling staff to become digital workers and to about equipping their staff for the digital age. But one that came up was this idea of digital fluency. You know, this is an ambition to have a digital first mindset, a digital fluency. And, and, and so I thought, well, that's interesting. What does that actually mean? Uh, and I found that it it's actually, yes, it's well defined. It's about being having higher order competencies. It's about having the capabilities of confidently choosing and using tools. It's about being ethical, respectful, and responsible in, in your use of digital. And it's about being able to understand, organize, evaluate, and adapt digital content. So in fact, this concept of digital fluency, which is, is expressed in many of the strategies, is, is higher order. In other words, it's not really baseline. So from the, that information, we, we, we proposed a set of 10 um, areas of competence. So we had five areas of competence in DigiComp 2.1. We've got four in the digital workspace, workplace research. And now, now I, we started off with these 10. Now, the first eight of those are actually de developed further in the published set of digital competencies. 
But the last two reflect on and review digital workplace practices and explore, understand, and communicate with data were deemed to be beyond what we might think of as, as, as baseline. Ah, so what is baseline? So back to the dictionary. It's the minimum level of quality or safety or whatever that's considered to be necessary in a particular situation. Ah, right, baseline. So let's go back and, and start to look at some of the things that we were proposing and ask the question, is that really a baseline skill? So a set, select a search engine and use well-formulated search terms. Mm. So what, what do we mean by well-formulated? How would I know it's well-formulated? And is that where someone would start? Is that really baseline? What about manage privacy settings? Well, do you know how to do that? Why, why would we suggest that would be a baseline skill for someone? That they should take a file or a folder and apply privacy settings to that file or folder or know what the sharing options are going to be. So that, that was a bit of a, a kind of wake up moment, if you like, for us to say, right, we need to go back and, and really be quite careful about this and to ask the question, what, what is it that we are trying to produce in this baseline statement? And as Kenji said at the, at the very start of this, it is about where do we start? If I'm a new member of staff joining a college in a support role or, or a professional role, what would I be expected to do? Um, and that led us to the published set of baseline digital capabilities. They've been labeled as being for support staff, but in fact, they're for all staff, all professional staff and all staff in, in colleges. Now, I, I just want to say something very briefly about that. If you look at the first seven of these, you'll see that we can, we could self-assess on that, couldn't we? I, I can say, can I actually name and save a file into a, a named folder or, or a specified folder? I, I can do that or I'm not very sure about doing it. So I've got some means of assessing myself. But if you look at number eight, which is adopting a digital first mindset, you can see that we're back in that territory about knowing how I'm getting on with digital and being able to adapt what I'm doing for digital. So number eight, in a way, takes us a bit out of that baseline concept. At the same time, it's very important it's really quite important that someone who is being exposed to di digital in the workplace actually approaches it with a mindset that says, I, 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 I'm happy to accept that there will be changes in my work practices that involve using digital, and that's just the way of it. And, and I, I need to make that change for myself to adopt that better practice. It's not about seeking out new digital ways of doing things. It's about just saying, here is how the college is going to manage. Um, for example, i just take a very simple example, booking, booking leave, booking time for leave, or, or applying for expenses to be paid. It's an online form. Can I do, can I do that? Am I prepared just to accept that that's the way the college does things digitally. And I'm going to stop at that. Um, Kenji and, and Jason, and we can return. Well, as always, Walter, you, you, you have timed it excellently. And we, and we still have three minutes. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm intrigued about the, the point you said at the the end and when I say I'm intrigued I know we discussed this quite a lot <laughs> but in in that sense of 
how colleges come to to evaluate the capabilities of their staff and and it's always going to be a struggle um do you have any thoughts around how do you assess ability especially if you're relying upon self-evaluation are there particular approaches that give you a better idea of real capability of your staff? Well, well I, 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 I do, Kenji. I, I think the best way is, is through actually asking someone to do a task and observing them, but of course that's very expensive. Uh, what some um, other um, providers have done is they've provided simulations so it's possible to simulate a, a task uh, and to say, here's a simulation, now you have to complete the next step, either make a, a menu selection or, or indeed, um, um, yeah, you, that's usually what you have to do, is and you're that, presented with a scenario, what's the, next, what's the menu selection that will allow you to complete the next step? That re really brings back memories of ECDL. Oh, yes, it, it oh. does, yeah. <laughs> Oh, what happy times. <laughs> now, obviously, I, I, I think the best tool that's available to the sector at the moment, um, especially as it's free, Jason, <laughs> is, is the, the JISC discovery tool. And I, I think that idea of, of all institutions, to an extent, if, if all institutions use the same tool, <clears throat> the idea of having a snapshot of where you were in comparison with the rest of, of, of your sector, your peers, um, it, it's a valuable tool. It's a useful tool. Yeah. Um, and there's so much data that you can draw upon if, if it's open to, to the nation and everyone gets it for free, Jason. Not everyone, I'm afraid. Uh, further <laughs> education does for, for uh, yes, uh, higher education. There's still a, a cost. Um, but I think Fair. it goes on to, they think there's, um, and uh, Walter, you know this very well, there's a lot of C's involved in digital, isn't there? Um, from capability to competence, to comfort, to confidence, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, competence and championing, even if you want to throw another one there. And it's uh, so um, the GIST discovery tool does a certain thing, which I think is different from the baseline. And that is, um, it tries to develop that, the, the mindset aspect of it, perhaps more than the hygiene aspects. And, uh, and again, one of the things I think we know very well is the pace of change and so interestingly for example in the baseline it mentions about um, their passwords and does we see passwords perhaps heading out uh, <laughs> as a concept and, and I, I think back to some of my early days as a lecturer my first um, few weeks and I was ha happily uh, quite um, digitally comfortable wasn't always competent but uh, I was comfortable certainly and I shared an office with a, another lecturer who wasn't perhaps so comfortable and I remember her asking about how to do something in Microsoft Word and she came over with her notepad in pen and was going to write down the sequence of menu commands to do something and my point back was look if you're going to write in your notepad every single sequence of clicks you're going to need for each thing you do you're going to need a big notepad and then that and, and from my point of view I was saying well is it something about a file is it about something about editing is it something what your way along the yeah, way yeah. And it showed a difference in approach. And I think we've got a place for both things. We need people capable of switching on their machine, uh, starting their browser and looking up stuff. And then that's a hygiene element. But then we need the people who aren't flummoxed by the fact that the mute button might move from the top right to the top left on a different uh, platform or a, on a different one. And so um, I, I think the, that continuum there is complex. And I think you've shown that uh, trying to find the right approaches for institutions to uh, to take their staff on a journey and recognising that indeed that will be a different journey for each member of staff depending on what they're being asked to do. I think I think that's a, a good statement to finish on as we come to the end of our time and I, I think the, the work that you've done Walter and just giving us an insight into the breadth of work that's done across the globe in this area is, is really valuable. I think at the end of the day for me good enough is a good standard <laughs> and and just knowing where to start is it's, it's still an important point you know coming coming into the college sector and and you know taking taking a career in education is a wonderful thing it's brilliant but there's so much to learn at the outset so anything that gives us an idea of where to take the first step can only help
Okay, Walter, <laughs> thanks for your contribution as always. And for the rest of you watching us on YouTube land, hopefully you'll be able to join us at a future virtual bridge session. But until then, stay safe. <laughs>